Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion. As you can tell from the title up there, it's time once again for another wrestling related video. It's been a while since I've done something wrestling related. I think Childhood Home, that's how long it's been, over a year, around a year and a half-ish. Now this, of course, is a episode I've been meaning to record for a while, and I originally wanted to get it out before WrestleMania occurred this year. But alas, I was unable to due to scheduling, you know, being able to finish watching the show and then being able to sit down and record it. It, of course, is WrestleMania 20, which we just passed the 20th anniversary of a little over a month ago. And, of course, this was the first WrestleMania I actually watched as it happened. Well, it wasn't the first WrestleMania that happened when I was actually a fan that was watching, watching. That was the one that happened the year before this one. This is the first one I actually watched. I spent my birthday money on it and not a waste of a purchase. And I actually still have my VHS copy that I recorded from watching it. It's actually over there in the VHS player. It's not what I watched for this review though. I watched it on the network and other than them doing some weird little fade to blacks and come back out at certain times, which is obviously for any ads they're going to throw on there. It didn't really seem like it was edited that much from the original broadcast, but it's been a while since I watched it. Now, it took place on March 14th of 2004 at Madison Square Garden, the third WrestleMania to emanate from the world's most famous arena after the original one in the 10th anniversary. And sadly, this is the last time they went to Madison Square Garden for the anniversary show because for... 30, they were in the area, but they weren't there, and for the recent 40, they went to an arena in Philadelphia, which I kind of get why they decided to do that after that, because they figure A has grown out of it, even though the previous three WrestleManias before this were in arenas. I It would have been nice to at least have it at Madison, but I could see why from a business standpoint they decided not to. It had an attendance of 20,000, and to make up for the fact that a smaller arena compared to where they were at the free previous three years. The tickets were higher, and of course people that couldn't get a first run paid the second run fee, which just shows scalpers have been around for a long time. I fucking hate scalpers. Anyway, they had $2.4 million in ticket sales, and this stimulated the local economy in New York by $13.5 million, and the buy rate on pay-per-view was $1 20,000. Well, that's a pretty decent amount of money there. Because if I remember right, when I bought it, it was from 50. I could be misremembering, but 20 years ago, 50 seems about right. So you do that by the 1 million, that's a decent amount, even if, like, let's say half of it goes to the pay per view company. Well, combined with everything, WWE made a pretty penny there. Now, this was when I was really in the heart of my fandom. I mean, first couple of years really is it but I did kind of fall out of it a little bit in 03 but that was mainly because of the ring terror over on Raw. I'm still watching Smackdown but just not as much and then other stuff going on in my life. 04 I really picked back up with it and continued onward until around 2013, 2014-ish when I started to fall off and it's been up there's been up and downs in the last decade it all depends on how the booking really has been going you know I'll keep an eye on it, but then sometimes I won't really watch for a while and then watch for a bit, usually around the big four. But of course, that didn't stop me from going to WrestleMania last year, which was a fun experience, other than all the air being driven out of the building on Sunday when Cody lost, but that's neither here nor there. Getting on to this, since it's been hard in my fandom, I was really looking forward to this, following all, all the big matches and waiting for it, and after watching it, I was not disappointed. Now, of course, the opening match, we saw Big Show defending his U.S. title against John Cena. Now, Big Show, even at this point, and this is more in retrospect, his whole thing about him having constant face and heel turns had already started. If they were going to try to use him as a big attraction like Andre, that was long since past. But considering this is also a different wrestling era than Andre's, it's kind of hard to do that unless you do... Like what they did with Undertaker in the next couple of years where he rarely makes appearances on SmackDown. When he does, it's important. But you could have done that with him, but we all know that's not going to happen in 
this tour era, especially when you put a title on him. As a U.S. champion, I actually thought Big Show did a pretty good job, especially since his, he won it from Eddie Guerrero and their whole feud, which included that big moment where Big Show had the burritos with the laxatives in it and he was in the toilet without the toilet paper and then he kicks the door in and then brings in the septic truck. <laughs> that whole fun stuff. And seeing how this was the beginning of his rise into what would become his dominant 16 world title run. That he mainly just ended a couple years ago. I mean he's still technically wrestling but he's now in semi status so it's definitely fallen off unless they decide to throw a 17th world title on him. Now, for what this is, this is a pretty good opening match. I mean, Cena, he's not fully green here, but he's not quite the worker he would become a decade later, like when he's doing his U.S. title open tournament, or even the latter half of the 2000s when the whole Super Cena five moves of doom thing was in its big run of joke. But, you know, he could still work a little bit. But here... We can start to see the beginning of what he would become from a worker standpoint. And going with Big Show, it is the type of match you would expect. Whereas Big Show is the big nasty heel, dominating Cena, and Cena doing his typical white meat baby face stuff. But of course, in the guise of the character he was at this point. Because he was still hardcore doctor of thugonomics, Cena. That would not really go away until like two years later. Because his early first world title run, he still had that there. It wouldn't be until, like, next title run-ish that it started to fade out more, incorporating some of the Marine shtick, which was a huge shame. If he had kept that Doctor of Thugonomics stuff a little bit longer, we probably wouldn't have turned on him as fast, or the fandom at large, anyway. Anyway, like I say, the show dominates Cena a lot. Cena does make comeback moves at times, but the show keeps dominating. And at one point, Cena, in his comeback, hits Big Show with an F.U., the later attitude adjustment, but F.U. was such a bigger name. Especially with some of the jokes that they could throw in the game. F.U. Taz, F.U. Of course, show kicks out, because at this point, Cena is a mid-carder, and it's not as big a deal if someone kicks out of your finisher as a mid-carder, depending on what it is. But, but Big Show being the big, burly bastard that he is, it would make sense that in a mid-card one, he's going to at least kick out of one finisher, especially at Mania. And it really fit here. And of course, this is the moment everybody remembers Cena goes for the chain, the referee takes the chain, he gets one of those brass knuckles that he always had on him, hits Shell with it, does another FU for the pin, his first singles title in WWE, and it's this title run and the following one that really helps cement Cena as a fan favorite and showed that he is a guy that can carry the company forward. And it's not bad for a guy that in 2002 they were going to cut because he wasn't connecting with the audience until he did his uh, vanilla... Ice impersonation on the Halloween episode of SmackDown, so it shows sometimes you have a little faith in the guy, trust the long term booking, and it'll go forward. And as you can see, I'm kind of a Cena fan. I'm more a fan of this era of Cena, where it's the Doctor of Thongonomics, but the fact that he did have a long, successful career just shows that sometimes you gotta trust the talent and let them develop on screen. The second match, this one. It, along with a match later on the card, is the epitome of not every wrestler needs to be on Mania, especially later on Mania as it actually developed. Earlier Mania, you can kind of get away with it, but this one, this one, yeah. And even when I was watching this when the show debuted, this is one where I'm like, I don't even remember anything about this one being developed. But for a match between two matches that actually had a long term story, it's good for a filler match. It's just a shame that it took up the time it did where instead you can get, could have given the time to a different match or you could have tried to throw on another singles match. Or you could have just put them together and done either one of them defending against another team on the card and the other one on Heat. Or you could have just done, since it's WrestleMania 20, just for bragging rights, champions versus champions. But alas, that's just, that's just armchair booking years after the fact. This, of course, was the World Tag Team Champions, RVD and Booker T, a thrown-together tag team that actually did have some good success, defending against Garrison Cade and Mark Jindrak. I don't even remember much about their team other than this match. Bubba Ray and Devon, the Dudley Boys, 
and Conway and Dupree, La Resistance. This, of course, was when La Resistance was just the duo where it was Dupree, the Frenchman, and Conway, the French sympathizer, which they bring that up on commentary. Of course, Dupree, I thought he was all right in this team, but I remember most of his stuff from when he was a singles wrestler once he got traded to SmackDown. That's, of course, when we get that whole fun stuff with Con Con commentary with Taz, I'm a Frenchman, I'm a Frenchman, that old stuff. And, of course, Fifi the dog. <laughs> this match went 7 minutes and 49 seconds. And there's not really much to talk about it. It's a fatal four-way match where you could tag anyone into the match. Which, of course, is like, why would you tag anyone other than your partner in unless you're desperate? And I think it would have made much more sense if it was elimination and they did a couple quick eliminations. But even then, probably some people would be like, 7 minutes and 49 seconds? That's a little weird, but... Hey, you book it right, but then it'd just be a high spot match. And that's more or less what this is. It's slow at first, and then the last minute or so is when the match really kicks in. And It's just a forgettable match, other than the fact that RVD and Booker T retain. And what they retained with, what I got here in the notes, is a scissors kick into a five-star on Conway for the pin. And that's really all that there is to talk about the match, even though I had watched it. I remember more about what happened in the weeks after this match and the match itself where the two would lose the tag team titles eventually then they get traded to SmackDown which of course leads into Booker's heel turn which carried into all of his big storylines on SmackDown going forward including him winning the King of the Ring and becoming King Booker. Now the next match one of the f couple matches on the card that are not for a title and it's all about Bragging rights and it's personal. It's Chris Jericho versus Christian singles match. Now this is a storyline that's been building throughout the year where Jericho and Christian made a bet with each other that one can get with one of the divas before the other. I believe it was Christian trying to get with Lita, but Jericho is trying to get with Trish. And of course Trish finds out about the whole bet and there's a thing where Jericho is talking to her through the shower and just saying he wants to be a part of her life. Now I love how they edited that because if you actually watch the storyline from week to week, that whole scene, Trish is not even in that in the shower. It's I believe a May Young or Moolah in there, so it's a comedy thing, but they edited at least the serious part of it into here. Then there was an episode of Raw where Bischoff put Trish in a match with Kane. And of course Christian turns on Jericho, they, they get their whole feud going forward and the match is set for Mania. And these two, they go out there and have a match like you would expect these two to go. These two workhorses of the company go out there. Alright. And they go out there, you know, exchange holds and all that back and forth. Pretty good. They make good use of the almost 15 minutes that they have. I didn't put any big spots on here. But considering who's involved, you get the moves you expect until the end of the match where Trish comes out she accidentally hits Jericho or should I say accidentally and Jericho gets pinned by Christian and in the aftermatch Trish turns on Jericho and then aligns herself with Christian and smooches him and they walk out so you know things are going to be continuing and if I remember right I think they do for a little bit uh, the main thing to mention about this match here is this was the last match that was officiated by Tim White who retired officially from refereeing afterwards because he was injured in one of the Hell in a Cell matches and then he refereed maybe once before that after that and then this was his last one after that the only times he appeared was in those uh, WWE.com sketches where he kept trying to commit suicide every week <laughs> and the next we get the handicap match between the Rock and Sock Connection, Dwayne the Rock Johnson and Mick Foley against Evolution, Ric Flair, Randy Orton, and Dave Batista. Now this storyline had been building. It started with Orton and Mick Foley, because this was when Orton was really in his legend killer gimmick, you know, attacking all the different legends. He attacked Harley Race, spitting in his face. He attacked Jake before Jake could bring out Damien and a bunch of other legends. And then, of course, Foley was one of them. They were going to have a match on Raw, and Foley walked out. Foley came back into the Royal Rumble, got into a little scuffle with Orton. 
and they just kept going and going until Mick decided to bring out the big guns and of course he brought out the rock and of course this is when the rock was in his very very light schedule mode I mean his last big big run before this was the previous year when we got Hollywood Rock and before that I think his last big big run was in 02 when he won the Undisputed title and then before that of course was his whole storyline in 01 but as you can see from 01 to this it's a slow little exit where he'd make appearances but this was his last little run until his contract expired and then he went to Hollywood and he didn't come back until he inducted his father and grandfather into the Hall of Fame and then of course his feud with Cena and that whole thing but here his last little run before his contract expires for what it is pretty decent it's nice to see the rock with the facial hair here he's not like super big like he'd become in later years but still good to see him make a comeback as a face here for his last little hurrah in his original run teaming up with Mick Foley going out there in Wrestlemania which of course the rock cuts a promo the only way the rock can talking about that he's come back to Wrestlemania they're gonna go out there face evolution and this is the rock was what the rock and sock is cooking and of course around this time we got a call back to that wonderful segment on Raw many years before which is one of the highest rated segments if I remember right I don't got the numbers in front of me where Mick did the rock this is your life but we got the reverse Mick Foley this is your life the moment I saw that even at this point in my wrestling fandom I had some knowledge of that one the moment I saw that I smirked so I can only imagine what long term fans must have been thinking when they saw that on their TV and it was pretty fun. Now the match itself it is what you would expect between these two teams with the five combatants involved. You get all the spots you're expecting from him. Flair he goes out there and struts only the way Ric Flair can and of course this is after he's overcome his confidence issues because going into WrestleMania 18 he had all of those confidence issues about whether he can still work and of course, in the years and all that since then, it's shown that he can still work only the way Ric Flair can. So he goes out there and works the way he can. Rock, still in his prime here, works the way he can. Orton, not quite as snug and snappy of a worker as he would become in the later years. But you can definitely see the beginnings of that here still. And as a legend killer, great heel gimmick, especially as a member of Evolution. Mick Foley. Mick Foley, what else can I say? You get what you expect with him, especially with the storyline where he's going against the young whippersnapper Randy. The only one that really doesn't stand out in this match is Batista, and that's because at this point, all Batista is in the group is the heavy. Which, considering that the previous gimmick he had in WWE was his Deacon Batista, and then he kind of got lost in the shuffle until he became a member of Evolution, as to be expected. And it's one of those things where you look at this and look at a year later where he was wrestling Triple H for the world title. It just shows what a year can do. Of course, part of that is how they'll bungle Randy later on in the year, but we'll get to that once we get to the end of the match. One of my favorite moments in this match, of course, is when Rock mocks Flair Strut before doing a people's elbow, which that's a good little moment, which, of course, it follows Rick going to do a people's elbow and doing his little strut, but then of course he gets caught doing that, and which leads to that. And one of my other favorite moments that always stood out to me was of course Rick goes up to the top rope and King's on commentary with JR and King's like, Flair, this has never worked in all the years I've known you. And once again, it does not work. And the match ends with Randy reversing Mr. Socko into an RKO for the pin. And it's one of those ones where Mick kicks out right after the pin. He's like, two, two, two. And the ref's like, no, it was three. So Evolution gets the win after 17 minutes and 2 seconds. And that 17 minutes is filled with the type of work you would expect between all these people in. Like I mentioned with the character building wise, Batista is the one that doesn't really have much to do. I think the only thing I note I, he does in the match is a spine buster. Which of course is Batista, so at this point you expect a spine buster. Uh, following this match... Mick and Randy would continue their feud into Backlash, where Randy would defend his Intercontinental title against Mick as Cactus Jack in a hardcore match. And that is what really helped Randy's stock rise a little bit. And, of course, led to him later in the year 
winning the World Heavyweight title at SummerSlam. And then, of course, leading to that famous moment where he retains the world title the following night. You know, he's up on Batista's back, Evolution celebrating, and then Triple H is all like... The electric chair that kick Orton out leads to him defending the title against Triple H the following month. And he loses it. Randy Terror is still going strong here. And, of course, Orton, while he continues to face after this, is a whole day bungle him, which, of course, leads to the fans... Getting behind Batista with how they continue their storyline with him winning the Royal Rumble the following year with that famous moment where him and Cena accidentally eliminate each other, which leads to Vince storming down to the ring and inadvertently tearing both of his quads when he gets in the ring. I just love watching that back where he stands up. You can tell he tore it and he goes to get the other one and then he's just sitting in the ring. Now, the only thing with that is considering where they were going with the storyline with both Cena and Batista challenging for the titles of Mania, they could have just called an audible there and had them both be declared co-winners and then just have each of them challenge for their respective titles, respective brand's title. Simple as that. But no, that didn't happen. Alas. Now, the next match is... Definitely one that you could tell what era of wrestling we're in, and that, of course, is the Playboy Evening Gown match where we have Tori Wilson and Sable, the two Playboy cover girls, wrestling Miss Jackie and Stacey Keebler, and it's all over jealousy with being in Playboy. Nowadays, you definitely would not see the storyline built like this. It would probably just be an addendum to it, but I don't know if that many of the female wrestlers nowadays would want to be in Playboy the same way that they did. Of course, this is following the years, you know, Sable was in Playboy, then China was in Playboy, now Tori's in it, and of course, Christy Hemi would be in Playboy as well. So it was one of those badges of honor for the Divas here. And so it being in the storyline in this era makes sense. The match is only 2 minutes and 33 seconds, and I mean, none of the competitors are what you would call amazing workers. I mean, they can do their job pretty well, but... It's not going to be the prettiest match for two minutes at 33 seconds. It's more just for the eye candy of them coming out in the their uh, special Playboy evening gown attire. That's really the best I could say about this match. And it's a nice little segue between the handicap and what's coming next. What's coming next is another example of oh, yep, another example of getting everybody on the card for WrestleMania payday. And it's definitely a spot fest because it is for the Cruiserweight Championship. It is a Cruiserweight Open match where Chavo Guerrero was defending against Akio, Billy Kidman, Funaki, Jamie Noble, Nuzio, Rey Mysterio, Shannon Moore, Tajiri, and Ultimo Dragon. Which, that Ultimo Dragon thing is the only thing that they really edited out of the network broadcast. And that is because it's one of the few moments in Ultimo Dragon's WWE run that everybody remembers other than the fact he was on Mania. And he had... Uh, he had uh, music from uh, WWE's past. That, of course, is him almost tripping when he came out. Uh, I actually had to rewind. I'm like, did they cut that out? Oh, they cut it out. And it, I remember seeing that at first. I'm like, did he almost trip? It's like, wow. Uh, now, this match, other than that and the fact Chavo retains, the only other thing I can mention about it is the fact that Ray had his daredevil attire on here and he was the last one defeated by Chavo. And this is of course Chavo's run where he had his dad, or dad Chavo Guerrero Sr. aka Chavo Classic as his valet and this was following the little feud Chavo and Eddie had where Sr. comes in to try to mediate the thing between his brother and son, turns on Eddie and it continues their little run and of course Chavo would keep the Cruiserweight Championship until he inadvertently lost it to his dad that whole little thing was fun. At least it's still in the family. And now the Cruiserweight Championship is going old school. With the people in here, you get the spots you would expect. I mean, Tajiri at one point uses the mist. But if I'm right, Akio is the one who gets it. <laughs> and Jamie Noble, you got to love his character work. Of course, Funaki Smackdown's number one announcer. And I think Ultimo even gets a moonsault at one point. I didn't really put any notes in here because you know, I just didn't get around to it. It's a spot fest, what you expect with this one, and it is a fun little segue match. There's not really much else to say about it. Now, the next match, this is one that on paper could have been good, 
but what killed it is going to be the background because yes we're coming to the infamous match about halfway through the card at least match wise this is of course Brock Lesnar versus Bill Goldberg interpromotional singles match with Stone Cold Steve Austin as a referee now this is what fans at the time were calling a dream match because of the comparisons between Brock and Goldberg both came in being people from other sports of course Goldberg was a professional football player in the NFL Brock NCAA wrestling heavyweight champion signed out of college both came in after being in wrestling development for a little bit pushed to the moon having undefeated streaks Goldberg's was a little bit longer and he also had the US title first Brock really pushed the moon king of the ring then he beat The Rock at SummerSlam when they built it as Brock versus Rock and that match was actually very good from what I remember and then of course Brock being pushed through there lost his first world title to Big Show with Survivor Series 02 they turned him face the face turn I think it worked a little bit and then they turned him heel again later on with his little feud with Kurt which considering how over Kurt was when he came back after his surgery definitely definitely felt like the right time to turn back heel because Lesnar usually works better as a heel but then there are times where you can naturally make him face like his last run like farmer like farmer Brock that was perfect time to have him as a face and of course him continuing as a heel here in his third world title run you know his match with Bob Holly which is a nice way to bring Bob back especially from his injury and get a, at least a one-off match with them then he lost the world title to Eddie Guerrero after Goldberg interfered and part of that was because Brock interfered in the Royal Rumble and cost Goldberg the spot so in the words of Hall of Famer Grill Monsoon turnabout's fair play Goldberg was given a ticket to No Way Out, the previous pay-per-view, SmackDown exclusive, by Stone Cold. And in Stone Cold's words, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And we all know what Stone Cold would do if he was in Goldberg's shoes. He would have been raised in hell in that match. Just getting a finishing move to him to help cost him a match is the least of what would have happened. And of course that whole thing of, Eddie Guerrero stole my title. Now there's a weird thing there about, why would he be going after Goldberg instead of going after Eddie? Well, yeah, but then there's the whole thing. And storyline, before we mention what ends up happening, he still has plenty of time where he can go back after Eddie and get the title. He could take care of Goldberg first because they have their little thing there. Because if they don't settle their thing first, there's always, often a chance that Goldberg might keep interfering in his matches. But if they actually settle their things between them first like men, then once they're done with that, bygones speak of bygones. And of course he asks Vince to give him Goldberg and of course before that there was a thing on Gold before Goldberg went to No Way Out there was a thing where he's looking into the camera I don't care what show you're on I'm hunting your ass you're next nice little thing of course Vince at first does not really want to do the match because as he says in the promo Goldberg's a ticking time bomb and Brock Lesnar's not in the right state of mind so no one can maintain order then of course Stone Cold comes out and this is where the build of the match really turned to Lesnar and Stone Cold having a beef with each other, which makes sense considering Stone Cold's the one that gave Goldberg the ticket. But this is the way for them to write their way out of how to book this match, considering at this point in Goldberg's one year contract, they were at the point where all of their dates that he was contracted for on Raw were just about done. So it's kind of hard to build to a pay per view match at Mania. So, starting line reason for why Stone Cold is put there as the referee. And of course, Lesnar attacks Stone Cold when he's doing a referee job with Vince and Eric. Steals his four-wheeler, which Stone Cold was driving in the ring. This is when he was the sheriff of Raw. That whole thing, you know, like Triple H pointing at him. Are you wearing a badge? Of course, since leads to the episode of SmackDown where Stone Cold went there to get his four-wheeler. The whole roster was out out there with Brock and Paul Heyman and everyone walked away and they all thought Big Show was going to be the only one to stay in his way and Big Show stepped to the side and was like, yeah! Then they all walk out on him. So Cole gets his four-wheeler back and we go to this match. Now the video package for this match very well edited together. It takes all those little 
thing that I was just bringing up in this build up and edits in a way to where you get really pumped for it. Then of course all three participants come down Stone Cold rides his four wheeler down to the ring. Lesnar comes down there as usual stuff. Goldberg you know the escorted to the ring. He's got a bandage on him for some reason. The only thing that really ruins Goldberg's entrance here is it's, it's his WWE theme which I didn't have an issue with, but it is not as catchy as his WCW one. But of course, they got a WWE if I am. That's why they also had him have longer matches with certain people. Like some of them could work though. And they get down, they stare at each other, and as a lot of people like to say, and then the bell rang. Now, what hurt this match was the fans turning against them, because at this point, ball, the entire audience knows what both competitors are doing. They're going to be leaving. Goldberg, because his contract is up and he had no interest in renewing, which is why there's the whole thing about Lesnar originally being scheduled to win this match, until he went to Vince and told Vince he wanted out of his contract and he wanted to go home because he wanted to try the NFL. Which I get. I mean, he was always a football guy, in addition to being an amateur wrestling guy. And he wanted to be able to try doing the NFL so he, he couldn't look, look back at it years later and go, oh, well, only if I did try it. You know, better to try it and fail than not to have tried it at all. And, of course, the whole thing with Vince, he always seems to have a thing when he's told something he doesn't want to hear by somebody. He always got to take it out on him. Or always got to do it, so they change the plans. Which, if both people are leaving, it doesn't really matter who is going to win. So I can kind of see why they decided to change the finish and have Goldberg win, but... Having Lesnar win, your own homegrown guy, wouldn't have been as bad as an idea, but with Lesnar leaving... It might not have worked as well, but it would have given them fodder for years later for Goldberg having another match with them. But with how it actually ended, it makes a little more sense for the rematch years later that Brock wanted it, if I remember right. But of course, the rumor got out, the fans knew, and they turned against him. Thankfully, JR and King, who are on commentary, they at least had a good sense to at least mention it in passing for those not in the know that there was rumors. And, of course, they didn't really confirm it was true until the SmackDown afterwards, and they had Paul Heyman come out and mention it. Now, because of the fans turning against them, it takes a while for this match to build up. It was 13 minutes and 41 seconds, and you really do feel that length throughout the first part of it. Uh, and as they're going, you're like, ah, oh. I mean, it's two big burly guys. So it's what you would expect, but the fans not being into it is what kills it. Because you can have two big burly guys out there that don't work the most technical matches, even though of the two, Lesnar's probably the more technical one, especially in this era. And it worked with the right match setup. Case in point, Hogan Warrior won at WrestleMania 6. And the fans are really into that one, and that's what helps it. If they weren't into it, that match would have stunk. And this is a good example of what happens when they're not into it. It's not until later in the match when they actually start going for their signature moves or trying to hit them that the match picks up. I mean, even Stone Cold there as a referee just doing the bare minimum a refereeing job doesn't really help. But of course, once they start hitting their signature moves, the matches pick up a little bit. Fans get into it. Lesnar at one point hits an F5. Goldberg kicks out. And of course, Goldberg hits Lesnar with a spear. Hits the jackhammer. The win. And, of course, he goes out of the ring. Lesnar gets up, and he's glaring at Stone Cold. Looks at the audience, flips them off because of them turning against him. Then flips Stone Cold off. Stunner. Brock goes down. And that's Brock's last WWE appearance for eight years until he comes back on the Raw after WrestleMania. Walks into the ring and F5's John Cena. His last appearance. So he got Stone Cold, Stunner, out of the WWE. And into the NFL, New Japan, and then the UFC. Goldberg comes back in, shares some beers with Stone Cold. He's still selling the effects of the F5, so nice selling on Goldberg's part there. Then in the middle of a beer, Stone Cold turns, stunners Goldberg, and stuns Goldberg out of the WWE for over a decade. And of course, with that, Stone Cold standing tall, walking out of there with a beer. And, of course, really makes sense because he's a Texas rattlesnake, and remember his phrase, DTA, don't trust anybody. After that, we get the next two matches, which are ones that if you're just watching this on fast forward, you can really skip. 
This next one is like the previous tag team title match where it's just get everybody on the card for a payday. It's another Fatal 4 tag match where it's just first one to get the pinfall wins. It's Too Cool, which at this point was Rikishi and Scotty Tuhati defending their WWE tag team titles against Haas and Benjamin, the world's greatest tag team, the Basham Brothers, and of course Farouk and Bradshaw, the APA. And that's really all that there is to talk about this match. Two cool wins. It would have been a better match if they were defending against one of those tag teams. Like, maybe this be the APA's last hurrah as a tag team at Mania. Because it's after this match that Farouk would retire as a full-time active competitor. And, of course, Bradshaw would morph into JPL and become a great rival opponent for Eddie Guerrero and a great heel world champion, although if you look at it, he was a long-term transitional champion between Guerrero and Cena, but he was a perfect heel. And if not that, it would have been a good one, good test for Haas and Benjamin or the Basham brothers up there on pay-per-view, I think especially the Bashams, because I think Haas and Benjamin had already been on Mania at this point. Well, of course, it, when it wasn't to be, though, because Too Cool would keep the titles, and they didn't lose them until an episode of SmackDown where they lost them to Hosh and Rico. And this, of course, was after Benjamin got sent to Raw and his whole and the draft and his whole thing where he kept winning singles matches against Triple H, starting his first little push. Ain't no stopping me now. That whole thing. There's not really much to say about this match other than who's in it and what happened afterwards. Next match is, of course, Victoria defending her WWE Women's Championship against Molly Holly. And this is a hair versus title match. Where Victoria loses, she loses the title. and Molly Holly loses, she'll have her head shaved. 4 minutes and 52 seconds. Victoria wins. And I just love how Molly reacts after she loses. Because this is all about the post-match where she hightails it out of there. And, of course, Victoria gets her, straps her in the chair, and, of course, is shaving her head. And she's bald for the remainder of her run here. And I just love how long it takes. It goes into the entrances for the next match. Now, this, I'm going to have to mention, was the return of the WWE Hall of Fame. I mean, by this point in the show, they've already come out and done their little intro thing. And this is an excellent... Hall of Fame class. Probably the next year's class is one of the best, but this is definitely a great class, but it's a nice especially since it's a return year one, because the previous class that was inducted was in 96, and of course that's when we got Captain Lou, Snuka, Killer Kowalski, Pat Patterson, Vince Sr. But for this one, we got a lot of good inductions. We got Big John Studd, we got Don Morocco, Greg Valentine, Harley Race, Jesse Ventura, which of course he does come out at one point and have a little tete-a-tete -tete with future President Donald Trump who's in the front row, which that whole thing, at the time it was harmless, in retrospect it's one of those things like, a little shocking, a little premonition there, isn't it? Junkyard Dog, Sergeant Slaughter, Superstar Billy Graham, Tito Santana, and Bobby the Brain Heenan. Which he is, is probably the most emotional since he was like, the only thing I wish is I wish Gorilla was here. Not a dry eye in the building at that point. Of course, it's also a little sad considering that since Junkyard Dog and Stud were both deceased at this point, we got that. And I think that is why in the years afterwards they try to do only one deceased wrestler in the Hall of Fame per year. And of course, this is also the one that started the celebrity wing of the Hall of Fame. And, of course, it's Pete Rose, of course, who appeared at multiple WrestleManias. And the running gag was, of course, him always getting tombstone by Kane, which is why it's only fitting that Kane is the one that inducted him. And, of course, when they all come out, they mention this man's probably going to make another Hall of Fame one day. Probably not until he's gone, too, but, alas, that's something. Now, the celebrity wing is one of those things that's always going to be controversial due to its nature. I feel there's nothing really wrong with having a celebrity wing. It's just who you should put in there. Like, let me just scan down here since I'm on the subject and see who's in the celebrity wing. Following year, we don't have anybody. 
Oh six, we got William Refrigerator Perry as a Hall of Fame inductee. Eh, not bad. Uh, let's um, uh, I'm looking for uh, Bob Bob Euchre in 2010. You could probably make the argument the person who inducted him probably deserved to go in more for the celebrity wing. And that's Dick Emerson, and that's for how he was influential in like Saturday Night's main event. Now, 2011 is really the one where it's like, yeah, no, that guy should not be in the celebrity wing. That's, of course, Drew Carey. And this, that is, of course, when they started doing the celebrity every year. We got Mike Tyson for the class of 2012. With how he was involved in WrestleMania 14, you can definitely say he deserves to be in the celebrity wing for that. And, of course, people who inducted him was DX. Uh, Donald Trump. That one really pushes it. I mean... His uh, hotel in Jersey, in Jersey is where they held two back-to-back -back manias. But it's like, just because he held the venue doesn't really mean he deserves to go in. That one, you know, Vince decided to push in. Uh, Mr. T, definitely. I mean, main event first WrestleMania with Hogan and his other wrestling appearances definitely deserves to go in. Arnold Schwarzenegger the following year. That's really a debatable one because he just made one appearance on SmackDown, but. That one you know they definitely did as a favor for the guy who inducted him Triple H. Uh, Snoop Dogg was the following year. That one, eh, that one definitely not. The following year, I'm not really seeing any. But, the but they also were doing a lot of legacy inductees. Which that one I could probably do a whole separate video on. Kid Rock, following year, definitely didn't deserve to be in. Uh, William Shatner, oh yeah, definitely not. Ozzy Osbourne, I love Ozzy, but yeah, it should not be in a celebrity wing of the Hall of Fame. 2022. They didn't really have a celebrity that one, because they didn't have that many. Last year, it was Andy Kaufman, which, if there was anyone who deserved to be the first headliner for the celebrity wing, it should have been Andy, and he should have been in years before then, but last it didn't happen. But Andy is the reason why there should be a celebrity wing. But technically, you could have put Andy in there just as an individual, just for his feud with Jerry Lawler. You didn't necessarily have to put him in the celebrity wing. But if that's a way to get him in, that's a way to get him in. And, of course, this year, the celebrity was Muhammad Ali. Of course, it was Special Enforcer, the first WrestleMania. And, of course, part of the reason he was a great boxer was because he drew from professional wrestling, you know, as for his promos. And that's really all that there that I know kind of got on a side tangent there, but we're gonna talk about the Hall of Fame. I got to talk about that little elephant in the room on here, so that I will add a little bit of time to it, especially since some of these matches I haven't had a, a lot to talk about. Now these next three matches, I do have a little bit to talk about with them. Now this next match, the first of the big main events, we got Eddie Guerrero defending his WWE title against Kurt Angle. Now Eddie. Previous pay-per-view, won the WWE title from Brock Lesnar, defending against Kurt Angle. Now, Angle interjected himself into the feud with Eddie and Chavo, and then he turned on him when he was a special guest referee in one of their matches. Turned heel and turned on him. And, of course, it's what you would expect for Angle, that he just thinks that there should be a WWE champion that the people can be proud of. And, you know, he points out that Eddie is a former drug addict, and a drug addict is the last person we need representing the people as their WWE champion. And of course this led to Eddie giving that promo like I'm addicted, I say, I'm addicted to life. That whole thing. So Drug PSA Kurt Angle versus Eddie Guerrero. Perfect little feud. Although Angle kinda comes across as a hypocrite considering years later perk angle. That whole thing, but that's his real life issues, not his storyline issues. His match went twenty one minutes and considering how technical of a wrestler Eddie is, and definitely how technical of a wrestler the Olympic gold medalist Kurt is, this is what you would expect between the two. Just give them plenty of time, 20 minutes, have them go out there, and have them tell their story. Back and forth, a lot of technical moves. And of course, leading into the last part of the match, where Angle gets the ankle lock on him at one point, and he gets out of it, and then Eddie's really selling the ankle, like grabbing his ankle, and then of course, Kurt sees it, and like a shark, he's going back after the angle. 
and this leads to an excellent finish for this match where because he had been undoing his boot to try to relieve some of that pressure Kurt slides the boot off Kurt's taken aback he runs at him Eddie gets him in a pinning and pinfall definitely fits Guerrero's whole vibe of lie cheating and stealing and he he really got under Kurt's skin with this and retained the world title he got out of there and of course Kurt's reaction after the fact he's holding the boot he's looking at him he's like ah and he throws it out perfect way and it shows that you don't always have to end a world title match with like a big flashy move or submission sometimes just a finish that really fits the characters can do a pinfall like this it would be nice if we saw more finishes that are kind of in this vein if not quite the same so 21 minutes excellent match and then of course the next match is Undertaker versus Kane 2 at Wrestlemania this was of course the return of the dead man after Kane buried him alive at Survivor Series the previous year now I've already done a whole video in my Undertaker streakathon about this one a couple years ago but the build up for this match even though it's mostly Kane on TV it is a decent build up and I just love the way they edited it with that music that they put in there and the, the way they changed the footage it's a nice little build up package Kane comes out and I just love for the city background when he comes out they have a burn and even JR and King and on commentary is like oh my god JR the whole city's burning of course Kane comes out thinks nothing's gonna go on then the lights down crowd is anticipating and then they go wild when they hear oh yes and out comes Paul Bearer now you can definitely tell he's heftier than when we last saw him but Paul Bearer ooh, and when I saw this as a kid I'm like oh my god it's Paul Bearer yes because by this point I had watched some of the Undertaker's older matches some of the compilations so I knew the history between him and Paul so when I saw them like oh no this is going and then of course comes out with the druids and Taker comes out and while ring gear wise he still is essentially the American badass he was before gimmick wise he is back to his original dead man one complete with theme it's like a remix of his original theme but it's there and the match it is what it is I mean these guys are older than they were when they first wrestled at Wrestlemania and it doesn't take as many tombstones as back then, but considering how this was built up and what is going on in these characters' lives, both in and out of the ring, this is the type of match it, you really needed. It's less than eight minutes, so there's not a lot. Ends with Taker beating Kane and continuing the streak. Not really much else to say about it. If you want more of my inner thoughts on it, with more like breakdown of it, go to Streakathon and watch it there. Now we get to the main event of WrestleMania 20. And this is a match that, sadly in retrospect, because of what happened a couple years afterwards, a lot of people probably would have difficulty watching now. And sadly because of that, we're not going to get this in many video compilations anymore. And that, of course, is Triple H defending his World Heavyweight title against the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels and Chris Benoit. They had 24 minutes and 40 seconds, and Benoit won the world title by submission. Now, I'm not really going to touch on the whole thing with Ben Juan here because I have a whole separate video about my reaction to the Dark Side of the Ring episode. But, like I mentioned a lot of times, I have a preface at war. When it comes to Ben Juan, I can still watch his matches. I just have to separate what he did in the years afterwards from what I'm watching. Although, when there's a thing where, like, him going to do the diving headbutt or if he takes a head, a chair shot to the head or anything like that. I do feel a little, you know, because it's like, oh yeah, that probably helped contribute. Because I do go into the camp that CT probably did have a little impact on why he did what he did. Now, how much of an impact is the debatable part, but it is there. So I don't go into the whole thing like what uh, Paul Heyman said about I don't care. I mean, if he wants to think that I feel that way, he's entitled to feel that way. Because regardless, it had to have played an impact. But, like I said, I can get why if you feel that way or if you can't watch the match at all or any of them without feeling super uncomfortable. So, if there's any comments like that regarding, like, oh, I can't believe you can watch the matches on that, they're going to be automatically deleted. So, I'm just giving you that warning. Now, if it's just like, yeah, yeah, it's a good match, I just can't watch it, 
That's fine. Now, this is the type of match you would expect between these three, especially on the triple threat. I mean, we get the typical spots where one guy gets taken out for a while, and then two people work. And the way it's done de really feels in character for these three. Because between Triple H and Shawn Michaels, you really feel the history of between these two characters, former best friends, and of course the feud they had from when Shawn Michaels returned as an active competitor in 02, their street fight at SummerSlam, Hunter turning on him, Shawn winning the world title from him in the Elimination Chamber, and then of course the feud and match that they had leading up to this, including their last man standing match at the Royal Rumble, which led to the night Benoit was going to sign on the dotted line to face Triple H, Shawn Michaels coming out and signing instead, which of course led to Eric Bischoff declaring it a triple threat match. You really feel Benoit wants to win the title, that this he feels like is his last chance to win it. You really feel that in the way Benoit carries himself in the ring, and you get all the spots you would expect from these three. But later on in the match, there's a moment where they go into the announce tables, and you really could tell that they're wanting to put them through. But there's one moment here that I really love, where Triple H and Shawn Michaels, they just look at each other, and without, ex without even saying anything, they act in tandem, and then they put Benoit through the table. That right there, you can definitely tell that even though there's the animosity between them and storyline at this point, that they can still work as a team. And in retrospect, that's a little bit of foreshadowing for what we would get a couple years later when they reunited as DX. That they put aside all that thing for a common goal that they can really work together still. And of course, Benoit eventually gets back in the ring after he recovers a bit. And he's really selling it out there for a while. You know, people get busted open. You know, there's suplexes, there's sweet chin music, there's pedigrees, all flying. And at one point, Sean gets taken out of the ring, and it's down to Hunter and Benoit. And Benoit gets Triple H in the cross face, he gets him in the center of the ring. Triple H almost gets to the ropes, and then he does a thing where he's trying to roll out of it. But Benoit gets him, and he catches him in here. I know by this point in the match when I was watching it as a kid, I was really on the edge of my seat, like, okay, who is, is he going to win the title? I mean, I already knew the wrestling was staged at this point, not to the what degree and all that, but I could still suspend my disbelief, and even watching now, I still can, but it's different watching professional wrestling when you're young and suspending your disbelief versus when you're an adult. You could still get the same type of enjoyment out of it, but you can never really match that same enthusiasm as you could as a kid. But rewatching this in that point, I was remembering how enthusiastic I was watching it first time live. And just the way, I'm like, oh, come on, come on, tap, tap. I watch this, I'm like, okay, here he is. Triple H, he sold this perfectly, where you could definitely see the desperation, him trying to get out, him trying to fight out of it. And then the last few months before he tapped, you can see, oh, no, there's no way he's going to get out of it. And then he taps. And the crowd went wild. Now, I know some old school people feel that you can't get the same reaction from a submission as you can from a pinfall, because there's something about that one, two, three that the crowd just loves. Which, of course, there's truth in that. I mean, they'll count along with it and then go wild when they actually get the three. However, and Tony Schiavone is one of the people that goes with that one, there are times where a submission, you can get the same enjoyment. Like, if you do the old school thing where you drop the arms three times, or just even the once, and then it calls it, you can get the enjoyment out of it, but of course with them introducing the tap out, thank you, thank you Ken Shamrock, you can get the same one, especially if you build it up. Like with Benoit's story here, it was built up perfectly, and then him holding on to it, even though Triple H tried to roll out of it, him holding on for dear life, you know, and I don't like to use the analogy that much because of what it implies, but like holding on like a pit bull with that grip not letting go. And then Triple H tapping, especially with the way that the camera was set up. I mean, I'll give it to Kevin Dunn shit for a lot of the stupid stuff he does with the camera, but the way he had this set up here, perfect shot for this ending. Triple H tapping, crowd goes wild, Benoit on his knees all crying because he is now the man. And then, of course, JR on commentary going, Benoit's 18-year odyssey has culminated by winning the World Heavyweight Championship. And he's handed the world title, and he's all emotional. And what really helps make this is what happens afterwards, because he turns around, and there's Eddie. Eddie's already cleaned up from his match. He's got his title on there. He's looking at his buddy. And this ties into a moment they had earlier, where Eddie's like, hey, 
win, lose, or something tonight, you're still good, my buddy. You know, nice little moment between them, and here it is. And they hug, and they need to raise the titles together with the confetti coming down. And, of course, there's that whole thing on Dark Side of the Ring where Benoit's son is like, if they had retired there, that would have been perfect, which, yeah, that's a little bittersweet thing to think. This is the highest moment of their careers, and if Benoit and them had retired after this, it probably would have been a perfect thing, but this is still a nice little high to go out on the pay-per-view, despite what people like Kevin Nash would say, like, that's where the wrestling business died. It did not. Because there's that whole thing about them being too small. I think the too small argument really is stupid for the most part. I mean, there are times where you can make the argument, like like wrestlers that would fit into WWE's junior division. That one, yeah, that's where you can kind of go too small. Ray is kind of the limit of it because he could be a believable world champion, especially the whole David Goliath things. You just have to book him right. But someone like Benoit and Eddie... They're like normal-sized guys that, you know, height-wise, they just have a little bit more muscle mass on them. But they're still heavyweights. Like, I believe Benoit was built like a 230, 240. When I wrestled amateur in high school and middle school, that was like the upper end normally for heavyweight wrestlers. So someone being a heavyweight champion in that size makes sense. I think a lot of people that go that think more of like how... Vince and Vince Sr. did where they really won the big bruiser guys and all that which is more of the WWE North style which fit when it was a territory but then once you start going away from a territory and becoming a nationwide one and then you draw people from other territories you kind of have to homogenize your style and how you present stuff and there's the saying that there's no way Shawn Michaels was bigger than what these two guys was and no one questioned about him maybe initially but his character work and all that you don't question the fact he's too too small and of course we know the famous thing Triple H once saying that Kurt Angle is too small but are you going to tell me that the Olympic gold medalist is not a believable world champion no you're not and Ben Wallen while he's not the same technical powerhouse that an Olympic gold medalist would be he's still a powerhouse when it comes to technical wrestling and believable so that whole thing about them being too small, that was just a load of crap. I think that's just Nash talking out his backside. And then Nash always liked to talk and all that, but that's not what killed the wrestling business. If anything, well, nothing really killed the wrestling business at this time. If there's something that really hurt the wrestling business at this time, it was crap booking at the very ass end of what was the Ruthless Aggression era into the PG era making it too safe, which part of it was, of course, was a little what Benoit ended up doing, and, of course, Eddie passing away young. And then, of course, the whole stupid thing they did involving Linda's campaigns for Senate, other stupid stuff like dropping the blood, you know, the outrageous fines for blading, which I thought was stupid, even though I'll give Batista props for paying for it all himself. And then just other stupid booking decisions over the years and all that. That is what hurt the wrestling business. Not these two being world champions. Them being world champions actually was a good booking decision. Even though you can make the argument that they took the title off of both of them at the wrong moments. But that's more a retrospective thing considering what we saw happen the year after. Now of course Benoit, he ties back in. He's the one that loses the world title too. Randy Orton later in the year, and while he doesn't never recaptured the same level that he was here, he still had some pretty good matches after this. I mean, he was U.S. champion at one point, but of course, like I mentioned when I talked about it on Dark Side of the Ring, there was a possibility that it could have been that one little dark cloud over if he had actually gone to the pay-per-view, because then you would have had a murderer as your war as one of your world champions at a moment. But that's a what if that thankfully we didn't have to worry about. Now, all in all, this is a pretty good show. Now, it does have some lows on here. I mentioned like the two tag team title matches really do drag it down a bit. The Divas match for the era, it works, but it's like in retrospect, like, eh. Yeah, cruiserweight title match, what you expect for a cruiserweight title match. It just has too many people in there. Probably would have worked better as a one on one or maybe a fatal four way course the Goldberg Brock Lesnar match that one for what happened they made chicken tried to make chicken salad out of the chicken crap they were given the rest of the matches 
or what you would expect from the guys on there on this biggest stage and this is still a good Wrestlemania to watch I don't know where I'd rank it because I haven't watched all the manias in a while but maybe down the road I'll actually start putting on the box sets because a lot of the manias after this I don't know if I'd want to own them there's a, probably a couple in there I would want to own probably like 25, 30 which that's another thing to mention with the Ben Wall thing is this continues the tradition of every 10th Wrestlemania ending with a baby face in the main event overcoming the odds and leaving with the world title Wrestlemania 10 you had Bret Hart overcome Yokozuna leave with the world title this one Wrestlemania 30 Daniel Bryan overcoming all the odds leaving with the world title and then of course now probably the one good thing about me being able to record this after Wrestlemania 40 Cody Rhodes overcoming all the odds with some help from Undertaker and Seth Rollins and of course John Cena overcoming all the odds and leaving as undisputed champion ending the reign of Roman Reigns and there's not really much else to say about this one it definitely is a Wrestlemania that comes with my recommendation whether you have Peacock and watch it that way whether you can get a hold of the Wrestlemania box set DVD like I got or just the normal Wrestlemania DVD or a Blu-ray somewhere or if you can somehow find some other way I'm not, not going to recommend that live on camera but wherever you watch it definitely it's worth at least one watch especially if you were a wrestling fan in that era or you're just a wrestling fan that wants to catch up on some big moments definitely is worth one watch and that's really all I have to say about it until next time, everybody.